the path to graduate school. Um, so uh, just a little bit about me. I've already talked a little bit about me, but my, a little more of my background. So uh, I'm at Carter University now, but uh, I started out my uh, academic career at Michigan State University and uh, got a bachelor's degree in physics and math. Uh, and then I ended up going to the University of Texas at Austin and I did my graduate work there, a PhD in physics with a specialization in physical acoustics. Um, and uh, so that was my uh, first exposure to graduate school. And then uh, after that, then uh, uh, this talk is going to focus on graduate school, but oftentimes there's training beyond graduate school, uh, and that can go into postdoctoral or research type appointments. So I worked at a whole variety of places. I worked a little, little another year in Austin at a, at a lab called the uh, Advanced Research Laboratories, which is associated with the university, but off campus. Um, I worked a little, I got a, a fellowship at uh, National Institutes of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado. That was great to walk out of the back of my lab and up into the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Um, uh, I did some uh, work at the University of Windsor, across the river over here, um, and eventually I kind of transitioned over into more biomedical engineering and biomedical ultrasound type work. Uh, that was at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, and then uh, my boss ended up going to she was a faculty member there and ended up becoming a faculty member at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And so I followed her along. So kind of a circuitous path, but I eventually ended up at Kettering. So as far as graduate school goes, uh, it's always good to ask some questions about graduate school as you're starting to think about it. So first of all, should you go to graduate school? It's a first good, good first question. Uh, and also, when should you start planning for graduate school? What should you do as an undergraduate to get ready to go to graduate school? What should you know about the process of graduate school? Where do you find the right information? How can you narrow down your choices? How can you negotiate your options once you make some decisions? How can you succeed once you get there? And how should you pick your thesis about it? These are all good questions. I'll try to touch on these things as we go along. And uh, but anybody else has any experiences they wanna share? Uh, I have my set of experiences, but everyone has different ones. So uh, first of all, start with the beginning. Should you go to graduate school? <laughs> right, so first of all, do you like school? Because graduate school is more school, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if you're not so keen on school after you finish your undergraduate degree program, you probably don't wanna get more school. So that's the first good question. Um, also, do you like learning on your own? As you get into the graduate programs, there is more independent learning, less sort of class type learning. There's, you'll still take some classes, but a lot of what you'll start to do is more on your own. Okay, so that's something you, 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 it's helpful if you'd like to do that. Also, do you like research? Graduate degrees are about research, first and foremost, most of the time, especially if you get a PhD. Um, so that's something that's important to consider. Uh, if you like physics, but maybe you're into teaching mostly, you might still get go to graduate school because sometimes if you wanna get a teaching job, you still need to have some advanced degree, but oftentimes you still have to do some research. So unless you go to a physics education program, which is a different thing. Uh, are you self-motivated and curious about scientific topics? Okay, so as you become more independent, as a learner, you need to start to have some kind of your own ideas about things, right? And that requires a certain amount of self-motivation and curiosity. Uh, do you like teaching? Now, it's not necessarily to do teaching, necessarily in graduate school. It's not, not everyone does. Um, but oftentimes, at least for the first year or two, you do, especially at bigger institutions, because that's the way they afford to fund you. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that might be a consideration for you, if that's important to have funding. Are you interested in a career in research or teaching? Okay. So typically, if you want to do research at a company, a bigger company, or at a, uh, in a government lab, you need a PhD. That's often a prerequisite. Uh, oftentimes, if you want to be teaching at a larger university, you also need to have a PhD, or even at smaller universities. Um, you can sometimes get a master's degree and teach at a community college, but oftentimes you need a PhD and to work at bigger universities or colleges. So that's consideration. Also, are you interested in higher salaries? <laughs> Most people are. Uh, and and getting, a, getting a graduate degree will help you in that regard. Okay. Not the only way, but it's, it's uh, one way. 
So uh, just to give you some sense of this, then salary comparison by degree, this data is a few years old, but it's, I think the, the, the idea comes across here. So uh, this kind of shows you. So uh, if you start off here down at uh, the bottom of the graph, physics bachelors in non-STEM positions kind of gives you a, range, a median and a range here. Okay, so it's quite a wide range, but your median is down somewhere in the $50,000 range. Um, physics bachelors in STEM positions, okay, a little bit higher, closer to 60,000. Again, this is back in 2017, 2018. Uh, physics master's degree, a little more, more of a bump. You're talking more about 70,000 some dollars. Uh, PhDs in physics, though, uh, typically not kind of a wide range, but of an, more than $100,000 a year. Okay, that's your staff salary. So uh, having the degree makes a big impact on, on your earning ability, having a graduate degree. Um, so these are now also some additional salary information. Um, so on the left-hand side, you see then typical starting salaries for physics bachelors. Sorry, the text is a little bit small here, but um, it kind of divides by area. So for example, starting at the bottom here, uh, high school teachers or college or university teachers kind of arranging at the lower end. Uh, as you go up into the private sector, typically uh, certain government jobs or in the private sector, the salaries tend to go up, okay? So that again, these are people with just bachelor's degrees. Okay, so if you decide, no, nope, I don't wanna to go to graduate school, this is kind of typically the range of salaries you'll, you'll see. And it depends a lot on where you end up working, right? Um, if you do decide to get a PhD, for example, you can also, this, this graph here shows you some typical starting salaries for new physics doctorates. And again, it depends a lot on where you work. So you can see universities and colleges, much lower than for example, in the private sector. Uh, if you don't go straight into a faculty position, which is fairly typical nowadays, then um, you'll often do a postdoc. Uh, and that's, again, your salary will also depend on where you're working, like university versus government labs or the private um, institutions, private companies. Okay, so uh, these are the considerations and depending on what, what you want your lifestyle to be or what you want your earnings to be. Okay. So what about, uh, okay, I wanna to go to graduate school. What's the difference between say, just getting a master's degree or getting a PhD? So typically master's degree programs are typically two year programs. They're often primarily awarded for coursework. Some possible, some cases you do have to do some thesis research type work. Um, oftentimes primarily for professional degree programs. Um, and this can be sufficient as I mentioned for teaching at high school level or at community colleges. Uh, PhD, much typically much larger commitment of time, uh, typically five to seven years, including uh, not usually, that includes getting a master's degree if that's required. And um, again, primarily awarded for doing original research and is typically required for employment as a researcher in academia, government, and corporations. So quite a different time commitment um, and uh, quite a different focus in some cases. So, um, just as some, some statistics here about people with physics master's degrees only. So if you look on the left-hand side, there's a pie chart showing a distribution of where people end up, right? So fields of employment of exiting physics master's one degree year after degree, it's again, a few years old now, but it doesn't change too much over time. Uh, physics, astronomy, 28%, engineering, 26%, and then computer science, 15%, education, 14%. So you can see here, most of the people are not strictly in physics, right? They're in other things besides physics related fields. Um, here's salary ranges here. Uh, again, a little bit lower at colleges and universities than at in the private sector, but um, that's what you can expect to see with a master's degree. Uh, one exception is medical physics, okay? So medical physicists, uh, typically you can get a job uh, doing medical physics with a master's degree. And um, they make significantly more fun, <laughs> significantly higher salary. Um, and uh, that's just because it's in the medical field. And uh, you can st still the salaries are higher with PhDs uh, if you have a PhD in medical physics, uh, although it's not actually required. And this is this data is a little old now, but um, this is uh, it typically only goes up. So uh, that's uh, just some some difference there. If you're interested in medicine and physics. It can be a lucrative profession. Okay, so um, do you have to go to graduate school in physics? Um, 
this graph shows you a field of graduate study for physics bachelors in one year after degree. So often these are for people who maybe majored in physics, but then you can see 60% of them did go into physics as a graduate program, but 40% did 20% went into engineering, 20% into a variety of other things, math, medicine, math, education, physical sciences, computer sciences, all these things. So uh, some people just decide they want to switch their area of interest and still go to graduate school, but not in physics, and that's okay. Okay, so um, maybe you decide, okay, I think I want to go to graduate school. Um, when did you start, should you start planning? Typically, the recommendation is about 18 months before you plan to enroll, okay? Uh, it's a bit of a process. So um, typically then you're going to, in some cases, you want to take some exams, like things like the GRE or physics GRE. Those are only offered certain times a year, okay? Um, you need to plan for that. There are typically your application due dates for graduate programs are often in the fall. Start to, they start taking them in the fall, November, December. Reference letters often do sometimes in December. Application deadlines, um, that's sort of usually first pass, and then there's often a second pass in, 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 the, in the early part of the winter. Um, admission letters, scholarship offers can start to be made in February and March. Offers of acceptance, April or May or so, right? So it's a good year just to get to the process of applying and hearing back from various institutions. And then um, oftentimes then you'll start matriculate actually in the, in the following uh, fall. So, or August, late summer. So this is a process, right? So you wanna start, if you're thinking about this, junior year is not too early to think about getting going. And then certainly your senior year, you wanna be in process if you plan to go straight to graduate school. Okay, now I put on here earlier, you can start even thinking about that earlier because oftentimes uh, it's good to get some, try to figure out, do you want to actually do research? And one way you can do that is getting some research experience and that can be at your own institution, right? Working with a professor or through one of these research experience for undergraduate programs where you can go elsewhere to another institution. And, and that's great, it gives you good experience and it can be something you can put into your applications for graduate school. So again, it's not, uh, too early to start thinking about it if it's something you think you want to do. Okay, so what should you do as an undergraduate? Um, well, first of all, getting good grades helpful, right? That's something that graduate schools will look at. Um, getting involved with research, right? That shows you have a commitment to research and professors like to see that if they're going to take you on as a student. Uh, getting involved in teaching, right? Even as an undergraduate, maybe you can do some tutoring or help out as a TA at, your, uh, at some of the bigger institutions. Um, because that then shows that you can maybe be a TA as a graduate student, and you have that kind of experience. And um, also, you want to be able to convince professors to write strong letters of recommendation for you, okay? And that requires getting to know some professors, right? So, um, you know, oftentimes I'll ask my students to give me your resume or give me some information about you so I can write a good letter for them. Um, and that can include things like your academic performance, your motivation, why do you want to go to graduate school, your involvement in faculty research projects and your ability to work independently, right? All those things are the kinds of things that graduate schools are looking for. Again, if you have any questions, just stop me out, otherwise I'll keep going. Um, so what should you do as an undergrad? Uh, so I suggest several things. First of all, you wanna take the right courses in the right order, okay? Um, and use your electives wisely. So for example, if you think you wanna to go to graduate school in optics, then you wanna take some optics classes to make sure that that's something you wanna do. And that then you can also put that into your application that I'm interested in optics. Um, oftentimes by right courses in the right order, uh, if you're gonna in fact take some of these standardized exams or the physics GRE, um, they have certain expectations of what you have, what you should know before you take that exam. And so you may want to think carefully about what exams you're, what classes you're taking and make sure you get the prerequisites to take those classes. Um, another thing to do is try to figure out maybe what your areas of interest are, right? So typically graduates, graduate degrees are a narrowing, right? So you, physics undergraduate degrees are fairly broad, right? You take you, you got classes in almost all the major areas, quantum mechanics and classical mechanics and electricity magnetism. But as you get to graduate school, you, you'll still take some of those classes, but it tends to narrow quite a bit as you get into your specialty. So it's helpful to have some idea about what you want to do. Not necessarily. Sometimes people define what they want to do once they get to graduate school. That's okay. But um, it's good to start to find out. 
And also finally, be aware and be prepared for emerging fields or technologies, right? Oftentimes there'll be new areas that kind of come up. There's lots of funding that comes out for those new areas. And then people start to hire graduate students to do research in those areas, right? And so, for example, maybe nowadays, something like quantum computing is kind of a big thing, right? So people are starting to move into that area more and more. Okay, so those are all things you can do as an undergraduate. Okay, so what should you know about the process then? So uh, this can vary from place to place, but things that you typically will need, transcripts, right, of your, of your academic courses. Uh, sometimes now uh, either the GRE and or the physics GRE, that's the graduate record exam. Now this is changing. There's just kind of been a shift in, in, the, in what people, programs are expecting. Not all programs are expecting to have these standardized exams anymore, but some still do. So you want to check the program that you're interested in. And then recommendation letters, those are also very important. Uh, what other things? Well, you want to also look into the cost of attending graduate school, right? So oftentimes, if in a bigger programs, you won't have to pay for graduate school. That'll be, you'll get an offer that will include sort of a salary and they'll maybe even cover your tuition. And so maybe no out-of-pocket cost to you. But other programs are not, you know, maybe some certain specialized programs, maybe medical physics, you may have to pay. So that's something you may, you want to keep track of, right? If that's something, if you don't want to take out loans or whatever, um, something to be aware of. Um, you'll also be one aware of what kind of opportunities are there at various institutions to get funding. So teaching assistantships, research assistantships, fellowships, right? fellowships where they just give you money, right, um, to, to, to come to school there. So those are all things that you want to find out about at the individual programs. So, yeah. So I had, um, I went to another little conference on um, applying for graduate school in the whole process. Mm -hmm. And during that, um, someone was talking about the GRE mm -hmm. and they made the notion that if a graduate school requires the GRE, which doesn't seem like there's a whole bunch from what I can remember, they said that if they require the GRE, they're a graduate school you might not want to apply to. How do you feel about that? I don't know. Um... Like I said, I haven't applied to graduate school in a long time. Sure. So things have changed. When I was applying to graduate school, you had to take the GRE. There was no mm -hmm. choice. Yeah. And, um, so um, I think it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if you're interested in the program and you find faculty members that you think you want to work with, mm -hmm. I would go ahead and apply. And then if they make you, want, if you want to take, if they need you to take the GRE to do that, then you'll have to do that. So I, I wouldn't say that as, personally, I wouldn't put that as a determining factor. I think there are other things that are much more important. Sure. So, thank you. Um, speaking just briefly about the graduate record exam, uh, so basically the basic exam involves quantitative reasoning, verbal reasoning, and analytical writing exams over about a four hour duration. Um, typically it's available via computer delivery nowadays or from a testing center, costs a couple hundred dollars. There are a bunch of test centers around here. Um, you can go online and find out where they are. The subject tests, which the physics tests would fall under, uh, they're typically taken on a separate day from when you take the graduate record exam, and they're not offered at all the time. So there are specific times a year that they offer them, typically September, October, April, those kinds of things on paper. Um, that's when they're when they're done. And uh, if you're going to do this, I do suggest you take out, look up some, some of these prep books or get at least some idea about what's going to be on them so you can prepare to see what kind of questions are available on them to, to take. It's a good, good thing to do. Particularly the physics GRE, if you take that, it's 105 choice, multiple choice questions with a guessing penalty. It's about a three hour test. Uh, the distribution is based on what they consider to be the first three years of a semester system based physics curriculum. Okay, so classical mechanics, electromagnetism, optics and wave phenomena, thermo and stat mech, quantum mechanics, and various other things here. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't have all these things in my first three years. Okay. So, Again, that's one of the, your considerations. If, if you're planning to go to graduate school, you want to try to get more of those things than less. But again, you're probably not going to hit them all. Um, but just something to keep in mind. But again, not necessarily required for all programs nowadays. Uh, what about reference letters? So this is a strategic choice on your part, right? You want to pick people who you know will give you good letters, right? You do not want people writing letters for you who don't know you know, just so you can get letters, okay? So this is something you want to be purposeful about. 
So you want to pick people who are familiar with your coursework. Maybe you've had them as a professor, familiar, they, they maybe done research with them or you've done teaching with them. So or for them, those are the kinds of people you want to choose. You want to give them as much advance notice as possible. <laughs> Professors are very busy people, okay? <laughs> and um, you need to give them clear instructions about what needs to be done, right? To the point of, um, you know, does it does it need to be a paper letter on letterhead? Does it need to be submitted online? Most of them are online now. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you want to be explicit about. So um, that just helps them along. And one thing that will often, sometimes graduate programs will ask is, um, do you want to, we'll ask you as an applicant, do you want to waive your right to view the letters later on, right? And if you you can do, have the right to keep seeing later on, or you can waive that right. I typically recommend students to waive that right. Why? Because faculty will feel more um, open about writing honest letters if they know that maybe that you're not going to see them later on. Okay? I think that's, you'll get better letters that way. Um, so that's just something to be aware of that some programs will ask you, do you want to waive that right? So you have to make that own choice for yourself. Okay, so where can you find the right information about graduate schools? Um, so for physics and physics related fields, I recommend Grad School Shopper, as I mentioned earlier in the day here. Uh, it's a website you can go to and it you can it's great. You can type in uh, the names of the kinds of programs that you want to go to, you know, maybe specializations. I want to study optics or I want uh, universities in Michigan or wherever, whatever. And it will try to pull out that information for you. I will tell you that it does not have every university that has a graduate program. OK, um, typically graduate schools have to pay to put their information in. If, if they don't pay, they all, I think there's some basic information, but you're not going to get the full amount. Um, but it's a good starting point, I think. I, I recommend it to students. Um, you can also, of course, go to individual programs websites as well. I'll have your information there, but it's a good place to start. Um, they had paper books. I don't just not sure they're. I think they're still putting out paper books, but they're not as extensive as they used to be. The, the online part is the one that has most of the detail now. Okay, so um, okay, so you how do you narrow down your choices? There's lots and lots of graduate schools. So here's some things you can do. First of all, look at the GRE requirements. Right, if you have to take the GRE and you take it and you maybe you get a certain score do you meet the scores for that program they'll usually tell you what the typical scores are for people who enter that, that program you can imagine the scores at mit are probably different than other places so um that's something to consider look at the availability of specialties of interest this is really important right if you want to study optics or acoustics and you apply to a program and there's no one studying optics or acoustics you are not going to be happy there right so that's really important you want to look at the quality and quantity of work done in those specialties, right? Maybe I, you know, sometimes you'll go in, you'll type in a keyword, okay, I want to study acoustics. And it'll come up with a professor who's studying acoustics, but there's just one, <laughs> right? If it turns out that you don't get along with that professor or that professor not accepting students anymore, you, you don't want to find that out after you get there, right? Um, so that's something to consider. Um, also, uh, you want to actually look at faculty as potential advisors, right? You will have to eventually pick someone to work with, right? Or one or maybe more, more than one person, but usually one person to work with. And so that's something you want to evaluate. It's not just a matter of the program. It's the people who work there and what they're doing. You want to be able to look at the availability of teaching positions or funding through teaching positions, if that's important to you, right? Or if you, especially if you want to become a teacher and you want teaching experience, that's important. So you want to look at the availability, and oftentimes they'll have that information published. Or you can ask about it when you apply to the programs or you call the programs. Uh, you want to look at the amount of research funding that's available, also, if that's important to you, because um, that's um, that's some places have more funding than others, and that's something you need to know. Or want to know, may want to know. You want to look at departmental culture, okay? There are places that are highly competitive. And they expect their graduate students to work 80, 100 hours a week, right? I'm not saying that's a great thing. I'm just saying that that's some, sometimes the world, what the culture is in that particular department or in those particular laboratories. And again, if that's not what, you're, what you want your graduate student experience to be, then that's something you want to find out in advance. <laughs> um, not all, I'm, not, I'm not saying all places are like that, but there, there are places that you hear stories about that kind of thing. So, um, and also some departments are just, they have a, you know, there are bigger departments. Like I went to the University of Texas at Austin. We had uh, 300 graduate students in, at the university, I think more, maybe more than that. And there was 60 some faculty. It was a huge program. 
And that has certain advantages and that we could have those constantly colloquia and symposia going on all the time. Um, and there's lots of labs to choose from if you, you know, want to look around for places. But for some people that's overwhelming and they really want to go to a smaller space, smaller place. So that's a consideration. And then finally, you want to look at the geography of your campus environment. Um, you may say, well, what's the big deal? Well, if you're going to spend five to seven years of your life someplace, you're probably going to want to be at a place that you want to be in. You know, do you want to be in a big city? You know, do you want to be out in the country? Um, you know, maybe the best program in the world is out in Nebraska. And you just don't want to be in Nebraska. That's a consideration, right? Nothing against Nebraska. But um, uh, so that's the kind of thing you also want to think about, right? It's not just hopefully you have some life out of being a graduate, outside of being a graduate student. I went to the University of Texas at Austin. Austin was a great place. I love being in Austin. So, um, okay. So, how can you narrow down your choices? So, there's lots of choices. So, I, I don't know. There's different strategies to this. I, I suggest that students pick some stretch goals, right? So, maybe pick some schools that you really that are really great, great reputation, um, as long provided they have programs you're interested in, and apply it to them. Pick, pick some middle schools. Pick some schools that you know, maybe have good programs in your fields of interest, but maybe are not the top tier. And then maybe pick some safety schools. So schools with some large enrollment, uh, schools that have maybe a lot, have a lot of positions so that you're fairly confident you'll get in, right? If that's something you wanna do, you wanna go to school right away. So uh, yeah, it costs money to apply to all these schools, but you wanna have, I, I think it's a good idea to have some distribution. So and you can choose your own, make your own choices. Some people apply to just one school, they get in and they're completely happy. That's fine. So um, just some thoughts. Okay, so um, suppose that you apply to school, you get in, um, how do you negotiate your options? So now I'll, I'll temper this piece, this first piece of advice. So it says, do not accept any graduate admission in physics, they're not supporting you. Now that, 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 <laughs> Most places, bigger programs will provide some support. And I do recommend that you try to look at programs that do that. But if you really have your heart set on a program, and they have a really great program and, you, and a faculty member you like, and they don't have 100% support for you, that's something you'll just have to take into account. But most places nowadays, bigger programs will have support available. So that's something, something to consider. Oftentimes, you may have to do some teaching assistantship or research assistantship um, um, to get started. Oftentimes, a teaching assistantship, and then after that, you can move on to research funding or, or fellowships, depending on what's available. So it just depends from program to program. Um, some, again, some special, some, some exceptions to that could be, be specialized programs, I mean, medical physics, for example, or other professional degree programs where um, they don't necessarily have that much support available, right? It's um, so just things to consider. Uh, just to be clear about this, um, you will not be rich working as a graduate student. <laughs> Okay, these are graduate student stipends. Again, this data is a little bit old now, but I don't think it's increased that much uh, for better or for worse. So uh, uh, master's degree departments here, uh, doctoral departments here. Okay, uh, my, my, one of my former advisors said he called it genteel poverty. Um, so <laughs> it's enough to hopefully, you know, do the basics, cover your basic, cover your rent and, and food and things. But, um, you know, as you're in graduate school, it's not making money isn't usually the typical top focus. So just be aware of that. Um, another thing to consider is visiting the campus. Okay. Uh, again, if you're going to spend a long time in a place, you want to at least go there if you can. Um, oftentimes they'll pay for you to come visit, even. Um, you should, if they don't, you should ask for that about that. Um, you want to sit in when you get there, sit in on classes, on research seminars. Meet with, meet with the actual potential faculty advisors, people that you're actually thinking about working with. If you read their papers in advance uh, or get to know them, uh, maybe know them professionally in advance, um, try to meet with them, right? Talk with them, see how they're like. You know, you have to actually interact with these people, work with them for years, potentially. You want to know what they're like. Um, talk to students away from the official faculty and staff, right? Um, so, you know, the programs are trying to sell themselves to you, typically, right? And so they're going to tell you lots of things. And then you need to go talk to the graduate students who will tell you what's actually going on. <laughs> right. And those are not necessarily going to be different, but they could be. I know I definitely when I was looking around, um, you know, you got to say, don't take the class with this person or 
try to get advising with this person or whatever, right? They'll they'll tell you typically the straight story. So try to do that. Make sure you make a point to do that. And, and also try to maybe take a look around the vicinity, right? So you'll, you'll typically go to the campus, right? But, you know, there's a city usually around the campus that you probably want to find out about too, right? Walk around the neighborhoods uh, or find out what's going on. Um, I was lucky enough to stay with a graduate student when I went to one of my visits and I got to see some of the city when he took it out. So that was great. Also, sometimes you can ask for employment before you start graduate school. So maybe you're starting in, in, in August, but you know, I've got three months of rent I gotta pay, right? Or I gotta, <laughs> right? So ask to see if you can start a little early and sometimes that, that's possible. <laughs> okay, um, how can you succeed in graduate school? Okay, so a couple of suggestions here. Do you have the right prerequisite courses? Okay, so um, oftentimes in the graduate school programs, you'll take the sort of your core courses. So you wanna have electricity and magnetism and quantum mechanics or whatever else. Uh, you'll take those courses at a more advanced level in graduate school, so it's helpful to have those things in undergraduate. Um, also, um, are you focused on coursework during the first two years, right? So that's usually the first two years where you have most of your coursework in a graduate program, uh, and so that's where you want to really focus on that um, and, and, and get those good grades so you can move on to doing your research. Um, you just still usually have to get some minimum GPA even in the graduate program. Uh, do you have a good faculty advisor? Okay, that's important. Uh, if you don't get along well with your faculty advisor, that can really make for a miserable experience. So um, I ended up starting with one faculty advisor, and I, it's not that I didn't get along with him, but he kind of, we were, I just wasn't making progress in that particular topic. I kind of lost interest in it and ended up going to a different different topic. So that can happen, and it's it's okay to kind of think about those things. Do you have a support group? Are you networking? Okay, so um, I can definitely remember times when I was in graduate school. I'm sure other people have similar experiences, where you know you're taking class and I don't know graduate electromagnetism, and you've got these homework assignments, and you're like, oh, how can I possibly do this work? You know, and having a group of students to work with. I'm sure you have even had that experience as an undergraduate, but um, having a support group can really be helpful to get you through the tough times. Um, so that's an important thing. Um, Typically, most graduate programs will have some sort of qualifying exam. So it's some something or, or exam or, or, or something where you'll have to either take a physical exam or maybe you have to do a presentation. And that is kind of a make or break point where you're either going to continue on or you're done. Um, so that's something you want to be aware of. Find out what the requirements are so that you, you're preparing yourself properly for that. And then finally, can you persist through failure? Okay things aren't always going to go right. <laughs> um, you know, you're going to do experiments and they may not work, or you may try to apply for some fellowships and you might not get them. So persisting through that kind of kind of failure is an important thing. And, and, and um, sometimes you just need to do that. So um, that can help you succeed and get to the end point. Uh, some suggestions about thesis advising. Uh, so how should you pick your thesis advisor? Very carefully, okay? Um, I suggest meeting with several faculty, as uh, many as you can, actually. Uh, you know, obviously people are interested in, you're interested in their, their work, but um, some considerations, how hot is the advisor's research area, right? Um, that can be important because that means they may have more funding or they may have more connections with people or there's more opportunities after you graduate, right? Um, you can maybe, maybe you study a area that's very niche and then you have a hard time finding a job afterwards. So that can be a consideration. Um, is the advisor well-respected or well-known? And that can help you again to get jobs later on or um, help you to get published, which is an important factor oftentimes when you move on to your next position. Can the advisor support you as a research assistant? Do they have funding to do that? Can the advisor help you with your plans after graduation? Do they, do they know people? in the industry or in, in other universities if you want to do a teaching appointment. How easy is it to work with the advisor? Um, so some people are really laid back, easygoing. Um, they have other people are much more taskmasters. So it's one thing to keep in mind. And how supportive is the advisor? Okay. Um, are they going to help you not only get you through your academic work and your research thesis work, but can they support you as a person, as a human being? That can be an important factor. Okay, so what shouldn't you do in graduate school? 
Number one, don't freak out, okay? Graduate school is gonna be very challenging, even for good students, but it is possible, right? I can distinctly remember some of my first year courses and, you know, we took an exam and it's like, you know, half the class got 50% or below, right? And you're just like, wow. Um, <laughs> and these are all really bright people, right? And it's just, that's, that's just what the class was. Um, we all got through it. Don't be afraid to seek help, okay? Um, it's the kind of thing where if you get into trouble, it's not going to get better if you don't seek help. So um, make sure you talk to somebody, talk to, usually there's some advisor you can talk to, talk to um, even the you know, graduate secretary or uh, somebody who can, uh, department head even, who might be able to help you if you're getting into a situation that's you're having difficulty with, or even just mental health counseling in some cases. And finally, don't be afraid to change your advisor, research project specialties. You know, if you're two years into this program and you're just like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to do this tomorrow. That's probably not the right field for you if you're gonna spend, spend the rest of your career working on it, right? So um, it's okay. People do switch topics, they switch fields. And um, even, even once you become people become professionals, they often switch topics and switch fields. So um, make sure you keep that in mind. It's okay to do that kind of thing. Okay, so um, I'll stop there. I've been talking for quite a long time now. So are there any questions? Okay, so again, these are my opinions. Uh, people, other people may have different experiences, but uh, hopefully they'll at least give you some starting points to go with and um, some pieces of advice.